Good morning and welcome to you all here in the church and to anyone on Zoom and anybody who's going to be join, joining and listening to the recorded service in their own time. We'd like to welcome Streams of Worship this morning who are leading the service today. Elspeth and the recruited for today, Tom. Notices are on the printed sheets, so we'll just say a little prayer before we hand over to Streams of Worship for our wonderful service. So dear Father God, we worship your name as we gather here today, coming together as one in your presence. We praise you for all the wonderful deeds in our lives, our family and our friends. We bring before you the ones who need your support and your love. Please be with those who are troubled and also with those who are joyful. We thank you for those with us that you would guide our thoughts and actions to bring you glory. Strengthen us, fill us with your peace. May we love and serve each other as Jesus has served us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit to do your good work here on earth. Please be with those who are celebrating at Muddy Church that can't be here this morning but will be having their own service. We remember them and hope they're having a wonderful time. In your name's sake, Amen. Pass over to Streams of Worship. Tom is taking the first part of it, I do believe. Indeed. And I think people might need to be participating at some point, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But let's see. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne. Welcome to worship here on MHA Sunday. So our call to worship is from John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Our first hymn is one that you might have sung at school many years ago. It fits our theme beautifully and it's entitled Cross Over the Road. The words will be on the screen. Well, I welcome you to this service this morning. And uh, in particular, we think of our young people who are mostly, other than Erin, at Bonsall Camp this weekend with Muddy Church and Rooted. And we likewise were with the Boys Brigade, 19 of us, and the Girls Brigade last week at Torxey. And I have to tell you, the children from the Matlock area were an absolute credit to us, weren't they, Yvonne? They were wonderful. And Margaret agrees too, so there we are. And the singing was just phenomenal. Margaret played a trumpet, I played the guitar. And we started off with the first hymn on the Friday night. And to hear about 40 to 50 people, half of them children, singing with such gusto was absolutely wonderful. Rachel has uh, borrowed one of the songs we sang at camp because it fits their theme. That's Rachel Barclay. She's borrowed one of the songs to take to the camp at Bonsall. So they'll be singing about the sheep, the bar bar, he's a good shepherd, while we're singing other songs this morning. Anyway, words of welcome for our service here. I need to let you know that sadly Maureen yesterday was not too well at all. And she is in hospital, and therefore can we think of Maureen in particular this morning and remember her in our prayers. So if we just have a moment's silence, and then I will give you the opening prayer. Loving God, as we gather in your name this day, open our mouths to praise your name, Open our ears to hear your word and open our eyes to see where you are at work in your people, your church and your world. Amen. We say together, 
the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So our theme is friendship. And at the camp last weekend, our theme was the Olympic Games. So... You might have seen on the car park, we've done various rings in chalk on Thursday night for you. Rosemary, thank you very much for your creative skills. And uh, have a look at those as you go out of church, because those are a reminder of what young people do in our church. And if they can leave their mark, albeit on the car park, who knows, somebody walking up down Bank Road might see it, and it might just be a link for them with sport and our church. Olympic Games, as I said to the young people last week, they're actually called the Friendship Games, and thus they link very well with today's service. All the wars had to cease. You were not supposed to fight at all, and you could join with your friends and enemies you put down whatever you were firing or shooting with or whatever it was in those days and peace was to prevail for the duration of the games. You could fight but it was as an athlete rather than as a warring person and therefore those times were supposed to be special and we hope they are again very soon when the Olympic Games start. This is the story. You might well have heard of it. And it's really a cautionary tale because it's called The Envious Athlete. Long ago, there were two athletes in a city. They were great friends and they trained very hard. They trained together. And when the Games came, they always did particularly well, except that one was always slightly better than the other. They were always, I was going to say inch by inch, but it's centimetre by centimetre these days, together at the middle of the race, and almost to the last few metres, they were always neck and neck. But somehow, the first athlete always managed to get through and pip his mate at the posts. So the excitement came because he was always on the number one podium. Away, hooray, everybody cheering. And well done, number two, you've done very well. You were second. You two always beat everybody else. But then the second one, just to have a few doubts because as they met in the street, he'd overhear the conversations and people would slap the other one on the back and say, well done indeed, well done indeed, you've done so well for our city, you are the pride and joy of our nation. And number two, well done you, you've done very well indeed, that's excellent, well done. But you didn't quite do it quite as good as you made, did you? And thus the envy started to creep in. Well, time went on and the same thing happened time and time again. The same winner, the same person becoming second until one day their friendship started to wane because number one became very ill. And so number two started to win the races. And sadly, number one died. And so number two was there. Yes, he was number one on the podium. He was there and others were number two and number three. Well done, well done indeed. And then, it's a pity your mates died, isn't it? Because I think he might have just beaten you. Oops. And again, the envy crept in and it built up and built up. Because there was always a but. 
you weren't quite as good as your best friend. Well, the time came when a marble statue was erected in honor of athlete number one. And that really got him. Oh, gosh. He would walk past it at night, and then he had a great idea. He'd get a hammer and chisel, and he'd get out of him, bang, 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 when nobody was watching. And gradually, at night, he would chisel away the marble statue. And then, one night, oh, I'm so cross. People are still saying they remember him more than me. And I've just won the best race in our city. And they're saying, you've done so well. Again, but you're not quite as good as your friend. And then the inevitable happened. He chipped away so much that the marble statue fell on him and knocked him out. Envy had crept in. There are a lot of things you can get from that, aren't they? There's the envy point of view. It's the talent as well, that they were both so talented. But the envy crept in that he wasn't quite as good. And it makes us realize we've just got to try the best we can. And even if we're not the best at something, we can still do our very best. Because envy can sometimes spoil friendships. And as I said to the young people last week, we're in teams and you are in the Jesus team. As Tom said, this morning's service is based on material produced for MHA Sunday. And in the Crush Hall, there are some little leaflets if you'd like to take one. And we've also got on the collection plate some envelopes if you'd like to donate. The focus this year is on the MHA National Telephone Befriending Service, which connects people across the country. Although befriending isn't the same as being a friend, it has very similar elements. Each volunteer is matched with an older person and regularly contacts them, usually by telephone, to provide companionship and conversation. Some of the befriending relationships over time grow into true friendship. So we're going to think about friendship and what it means to us. On the tables, you'll find some bookmarks with trees on and the word friendship for you to colour throughout the worship. If you like, you could add your friends' names to the branches of the tree as we think about how we grow our friendships through our lives. While you make a start on that, I've got a few questions for you which you might like to discuss around your tables or with someone sitting near to you. Who is the first friend you remember from childhood? What do you remember doing together? And are you still in touch? Have a think, have a chat. <coughs> It's good to hear the buzz, but I'm going to bring you back. Don't worry, you can have another chat in a bit. So we've been thinking about our friends and why they're important to us. And we're going to continue by hearing about Dot and Volunteer Grace, who were introduced to one another by the MHA Befriending Service. The laughter and joy that Grace and Dot shared was obvious, wasn't it? I'm still trying to work out whether there was a connection between liking football and having a fingernail painted blue. 
It really helps to know that someone's thinking about you and is willing to take some time out of their day for you. Of course, the befriending relationship is mutual, allowing the older person a chance to give something back, with each person giving and receiving support, advice, wisdom and fun. Here's another question for you to think about. Has there been a friendship in your life that has changed your life for the better? Tell the person beside you a bit about this friendship and what it meant to you. Off you go. Friends are people who love and shape us, and we thank God for them as we sing our next hymn. Sing in the faith, 619. Thanks for friends who keep on loving. The reading chosen for this year for MHA Sunday is from Mark chapter 4. Thank you, Anne. The parable of the mustard seed. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, asked Jesus. What parable shall we use to explain it? It is like this. A man takes a mustard seed, the smallest seed in the world, and plants it in the ground. After a while it grows up and becomes the biggest of all plants. It puts out such large branches that the birds come and make the nests in its shade. Jesus preached his message to the people using many other parables like this. He told them as much as they could understand. He would not speak to them without using parables. But when he was alone with his disciples, he would explain everything to them. And it was good. This reading has been chosen as an illustration of the way that small acts, like making a regular telephone call, can have a big impact. As we saw in the video, Grace's small commitment to make a call once a week had blossomed into a real, mutual, life-giving relationship that was bringing huge joy and laughter to both Dot and Grace. If you turn your bookmark over, you'll see a dot in the middle representing a mustard seed. If you'd like to, you could add a few words about what friendship means to you, or maybe jot down a few small things that you or your friend have done which meant the world. And now we have one final question. A wise resident in one of the MHA care homes said friendships are not always measured in length. Sometimes they are measured by depth. Who have you got to know relatively recently but bonded with deeply? Off you go. Well, I'm really pleased to hear that you've got lots of friends to talk about. As we're celebrating MHA Sunday this morning, I thought we might just have a quick recap as to what MHA was. MHA was born out of Methodism, envisioned by Methodist minister Reverend Walter Hall and established by the Methodist Conference over 80 years ago. Like a growing plant, it has changed and developed and spread during that time. 
the initial provision of homes for older people has branched out into sheltered accommodation and then support for people living in their own homes. The development of a music therapy service increased expertise in nursing and dementia care and the growth of a chaplaincy service all helped to enable people to live later life well. Our next hymn was written last year for the 80th anniversary of MHA by one of their chaplains, Eric Thorne, and has an additional verse written this year by Abigail Ogier, the head of chaplaincy, which links in with befriending. And after that, I'm going to invite Phil to come and finish the worship for us today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> This turned out to be one of those services where you weren't quite sure what was actually going to happen. First of all, I didn't know how much time I'd have left. I'm not going to be very long, but just before we come to the prayers of intercession, I would like to share just a few quick thoughts. And then finally, with the themes today, were Methodist Homes for the Aged, uh, the parable of the mustard seed, and befriending. So in a two or three minutes, I'm going to try and pull those three things together and then come on to the prayers of intercession. Care for the elderly. I was listening to a, a Hustings quite, I don't try to get involved in politics, it's one of the televised ones and members were asking the panel questions and one of the questions was from a very young man, probably still in his teens, and he said, well you seem to have got these manifestos for the elderly people, what about, what, what are you promising for young people? And of course, doubtless, they talked about education and training and uh, work opportunities and so on, education. And um, then the, uh, one of the panelists says, ah, yes, but we can't ignore the older people because they are our parents and our grandparents. I thought it was an excellent point. And the young man actually was nodding, which I thought was good. He kind of got it. Yeah, that's right. And for those of us who have looked after aged people, it, it can be a bit challenging for Ruth and I for many years, uh, various aged parents. Uh, and uh, certainly we, we're thinking today about those who look after uh, people in sheltered homes and uh, nursing homes and Methodist homes for the aged. And this is a very important role in our society. So I began to think a bit about befriending and befrienders as our particular theme. We saw how the telephone ministry is working. Uh, great idea, that, isn't it? Simple, but often the best ideas are very simple like that. And how it brought questions about friendship. What are our best friends? Not, we were talking, it wasn't easy always to identify. I know for me personally, there's been all sorts of people in my life, I guess. But there are certainly people that are there for us in good times and bad times. Those who are there for us uh, when, you could say through thick and thin, when it's, things are going well and when they're not. They are there for us and we are there for them. And that would be a def definition for me of befriending and of friendship. So certainly these can play a huge part, providing company, companionship, and one of the great issues of today is loneliness, isolation, people who feel forgotten about. Over the years when I was a pastor many years ago and family friends, I've visited many old people's homes and it's always quite sad when you see some, you kind of know you're going to see and they sat in a chair and they seem to be asleep most of the afternoon. You, it's very sad when, you know, so I, I, I could think of people who've had very prominent lives, who've done an awful lot at work and in the community, in the life, in the church, and sometimes I hardly seem to get a visitor, and I used to think that was very sad when you think of all the time they'd given to others in their life. You know, it's said that the measure or quality of any society can be judged by how we treat the most vulnerable within it. I think that's worth repeating. It's a great thing to think about. It is said that the measure or quality of any society could be judged by how we treat the most vulnerable members within it. And so there's always that challenge of the haves, the have-nots, the challenge of, 
uh, those who are able, for those who are disadvantaged or disabled. And people also who, maybe the stronger, should also consider the weak. And so, finally, <laughs> the parable of the mustard seed, which actually has always been a particularly special parable to me, because I guess when I was about 11, when I was in this church, a preacher was preaching on the mustard seed. And that particular time, I had a dilemma, which I think a lot of people have, is that somehow, you know, you, you didn't feel good enough to be a Christian. You didn't feel worthy enough. Somehow you saw these people who, uh, we used to have loads of young people at our house on Cavendish Road. It was, you know, sometimes we had a gathering, it would be 50 or 60, somehow squashed, and it's called a squash. Christian young people's meeting, got out the youth praise books of the 1960s, the guitars. I was only little, but I remember it. And I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be a part of it. I thought these were great, you know, shiny, bright, beautiful people. And uh, I didn't feel good enough. And then one day, that thought about the mustard seed was like an epiphany to me. Because I thought, yeah, if I have that mustard seed of faith, maybe it is God who will provide the nourishment, the energy, the resources to make it grow into that great tree. And when you think about it, that tiny seed growing into something billions of times bigger, it's a remarkable, it's a miracle, it's something we take for granted, but that is precisely what a seed does. And so we were thinking about befriending, and maybe when we do things for others, we never know how far that will go in our society, in our community. A little may go a long way. That's the economics of the kingdom of God. And that's what the parable was about, how the kingdom of God is at work in the world. And so for a final thought on the mustard seed, I thought about most of the things that we cherish and value, things that we are grateful for in society. We think, think of the National Health Service, we can think of education, we could think of the welfare state, we could think about old age pensions. And the thing is that ordinary people took tiny incremental steps at some part in the history of our nation to make those things possible. It didn't start with a great plan, you know, it didn't start with great ideas, great finances, great resources, they just started out with a, a good idea, we might say a godly idea, and it bore fruit, and, and today we're grateful, we're gra we have gratitude for the things that we do enjoy, but are sometimes in danger of taking for granted. So we never know the power of the mustard seed. I'm going to think about this now in our prayers of intercession, particularly the Methodist homes for the aged. Let us pray. Dear Lord, on this Sunday, when we remember the Methodist homes for the aged, we give thanks for all who support, encourage, and pray for this worthy organization. We pray both for those who live in the residences of the Methodist homes for the aged, but also for staff and volunteers who give unstinting love and service. We thank you also for those who voluntarily give their time to uh, support lunch clubs, some who entertain, like Mr. Pilkington here, who goes around many old people's homes over the years. And we think about befrienders and the ministry of just being a good friend to that person at a very needy time, perhaps at the end of their life. So on this Sunday, we thank you particularly for all carers and befrienders for all those whose social presence makes such a difference to others, brightening their lives. And we remember all who are lonely, older people on their own, those in poor health. We've remembered also this day Maureen, and so we pray for her, Lord. And for any who cannot be with us this morning, and may this be a time when we think more about how we can best offer of our time in the love and care of others. Amen. Come to our final hymn, which I think is, O oh Jesus, I have promised. Lord, we've heard today how you can take a small thing 
and make it grow and spread. We pray that you will take our gifts and use them to spread your kingdom. Amen. And we close in a blessing. May our small acts of care grow by God's spirit to encompass all who need fellowship, friendship or love. May our small gifts of time be used fruitfully, blossoming into more than we expect or hope. And may our small acts of faith be rewarded in ways that surprise and delight us. And may the blessing of the God of love, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us and all those we care for now and forever. Amen.